Man, listen, TV. We got a new installment today. I got my guy John Connor with us. And yes, we sir. took it back to the essence, to the roots where we started. We back powered by I Am Hey Day, and we got this Jaywalk wall, Jaywalk Entertainment wall behind this. It's crazy. I know y'all see this joint. Um, but we not here to talk about what we got going on. We here to talk about John. John, you um, man, you might be, you might be one of the the best lyricists of all time, man. Like, wow. I don't know if you know wow. that, but like musically, you up there. Um, you got, I do want to ask you this, because I didn't know if it, you all, a lot of your earlier mixtapes, and you have a lot of mixtapes, they were inspired by, like, famous albums, titles. Um, what was Absolutely. That, was that, like, a marketing strategy? No, I didn't look at it like that at the time. I looked at it like, so I'm coming from Flint, Michigan, right? Yeah. And what I learned about the music business is, is it's uh, very clicky. Okay. The Atlanta people hang with the Atlanta people. The West Coast people hang with the West Coast people. The East Coast people help the East Coast people. So you got to think, when I came in the game, I didn't really, being from Flint, Michigan, even though it's artists from Michigan, but they from Detroit. So Flint and Detroit is like two different worlds. Yeah. So when I was doing the tapes, it was really pretty much like, yo, trying to get people's attention the best way I could. Because I felt like the in, nobody in the industry had no reason to want to help me. You, you feel me? Hey, you feel like it was any type of way disrespectful <clears throat> to him? Do you feel like they was uh, going to no, take it that way? No, not at all, because I didn't mean it as disrespect. I took it as these are the people that inspired me. These are the people that made me want to do what I do. And like I said, I felt like my voice wasn't being heard. So it's like, okay, while also paying respect and paying homage to the greats, I let the industry know, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm nice, you know what I'm saying? That was so a- it was like, I'll take on some of the biggest records ever, and make them my own. And in no way was it disrespect toward them. It was it was 100% paying homage and saluting those people. I personally don't think it was disrespect. I just wanted to know, like, where it was coming from because I was like, damn, I want to know why he did that. Like, because it was a good idea because you did it with Eminem, too. Yeah, yeah. I did. Jay, Eminem, Jay, Biggie, Eminem. Kanye, and Nas. And I might still I might still keep doing it. But, yeah, was it was my way you, of just getting keep people's attention. It. You got to keep because doing it because... You know what I'm saying? Because at the time, people was kind of looking at it almost like scared to touch certain records. And for me, it was like, yo, if I'm going to give people attention, I'll do whatever I got to do to get people's attention. So it was like I take on, you know, my idols beats, you know what I'm saying? And get people's attention by taking on some of these records that I remember when I did stand on the Eminem tape that I did. I was about uh, to say, I'm glad you brought it up because I was about to say something, but keep going. Go ahead. Yeah, my manager at the time, I wasn't going to do it because I was a little bit like, man, that's Stan. I don't even want to touch it. But my my uh, manager at the time was like, oh, you scared? And don't, and the last thing somebody going to do is call me scared or something. So he told me, like, oh, is you scared? I'm like, nah, nah. I'm going to take it on and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But in no way whatsoever was it this was it meant in any form of disrespect. It was my way of saying these people are who was the best in the world to me. And now I feel like I want to be in the same league in the same breath and mentioned in the same vein as these people, so I'm gonna take on their beats and 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 you know let the have some fun with it. Respect, respect. I like the way you put some artistry behind it, and then just try to make a new spin of it. And you you really put a real a real nice artistry behind how you did that. Like most people, musicians that might come in just I may have a freestyle on something that's classic or something like that. You put some real thought behind it, some real feeling behind that. I like that. You. Well, thank you, man. I was just hungry at the time, man. Just hungry and doing whatever I could do to get attention. Because like I say, being from a little city, Flint nobody in small. the industry was really caring about what I was talking about. Yeah, Flint is small, bro. Flint was so. small. Flint was Well, not small. no more, but, you know, Flint at that time. Flint yeah, was small. at that time, I was coming out like now. Of course, you got like the Rios and YNJs and RMC Mikes and all of these cats that are coming up and, and for the new generation of Flint artists. But at the time I was coming in the game in the early 2010s, it was I was the only one. You know what I'm saying? And before me, it was the late great MC Bree. And he was like 10, 15 years before me. Before you, so, so you was I'm looking the, at him trying to come up behind him. Say that again. So you was kind of looking at what he was doing as you was trying to come up. Absolutely. Like, because that's all people knew about Flint. They like, oh, you you from where MC Breed from. And when I got to Aftermath, it was uh the DOC was really cool with MC Breed. So when I told DOC that I was from Flint, he like Eric Breed. And I'm like, yeah, MC Breed. 
So it was like, we all in Flint, man, just been passing the torch from generation to generation. I'm lucky and grateful and blessed to still be here doing it. And I'm so grateful and happy for the young generation of Flint cast that's kind of paving the way again. So when you first, you see, man, you you taking some of my questions, man, because you just talking about the aftermath <laughs> my shit. Bad, I, my no, bad, No, you bro. good. Keep, I'm going to let you talk when you talk because you're giving game. I'm not going to cut you off. That's what I'm not going to do. Uh. Um, my fuck. The app when you so that that all those projects eventually led to you getting the aftermath. Mm hmm. What was that called like, bro? Like, what was it? What, how was you contacted? So the how the aftermath situation happened was I was doing my thing on the underground. I had got like a pretty big buzz on the under. And, you know, I came up in the blog era. You know, now nah, right two dope boys that piff. Uh, rap radar, like if you was getting on them blogs in the early 2010s, then you was doing what you was supposed to do. Hey, so, hey, I, I'm gonna I stop you real fast, and then I want you to keep going. Was you sad sure. when that piff died? Say that again. Was you sad when that piff died out? Cause you know it's yeah, gone. Yeah, yo, gone you know now. what? I actually was. It's gone, bro. I, had I was sad. I was sad when when that when that whole era kind of came to to a close. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Definitely. We got to bring that back. We lost a lot of classic music, you know, a lot of historical music in our culture when that piff went away. Yeah, I feel like the blogs was kind of like the new gatekeepers. You know what I'm saying? Because you had to be dope or consistent to be on the blogs. Now I feel like, you know, YouTube has kind of made it to where it just ain't no gatekeepers no more. Anybody could get on. Anybody could get on. You know what I mean? You so back to the aftermath situation because I cut you off. You was talking about no, that good. and what you was doing on that that level and all that. Well, yeah, I was doing my thing on the blogs and coming up, and um, I got to give all credit for that era of my life. Uh, my two managers at the time were uh, a cat named Young Sav and ex NBA player Mateen Cleaves. So the three of us was just grinding, releasing music all the time, every week just dropping music. So I had um, dropped an album called Unconscious State. And it charted on Billboard. Now, this is all independent. I had, before this, went on a tour with Exhibit. So when I was on tour with Exhibit, he would always say, like, yo, I'm going to help you out one day. And so one day came, after I charted on Billboard, he called me and he was just like, yo, I got an idea. I'm going to let Dr. Dre hear your music. So I was like, all right. And at the time, I wasn't really even tripping on it. I'm like, if Dr. Dre hear my music and he don't like it, at least my I know at I least did he heard something it. good enough to where it reached that level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it was like, I didn't even expect nothing out of that. He calls me back 30 minutes later like, oh, you think it's a game? Dre wants you to come to California. So I'm like, all right. Mm. So I'm like, cool. Got on the plane the next day and, and the rest was history. Shout That's out to crazy. Exhibit for making that plug. For That's me. crazy. So <laughs> Exhibit. Plug. Actually, real quick, before you say that, we got to give respect and credit to Exhibit's son, too. Because Exhibit's son was the one who found me on Twitter and he right. liked my music. And he put his dad on to my music. Wow. So that's how that happened. So you had that's no really. relationship with uh, Exhibit before that? None. None. That's we ain't know each other from the man in the moon. <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy, man. The music speaks for itself. The music so, speaks for itself. So when Exhibit, so what, when Exhibit called you, was that kind of like a, uh, like a, oh man, that kind of like threw you off too? Or you kind of, you already had a relationship with Exhibit before he hit you with the uh, Dr. Dre shit? Well, right. Exhibit, like I said, his son put him on to me. So really what just oh, happened on, was me trying to fast forward tour? through the story. I left some details out. Yeah. So it was like me and Exhibit had um, had a relationship a year prior to him making the Dre call. Okay. So first he hit me up like, yo, my son, like your music, you want to go on tour. So then, like I said, we ain't know each other from the man in the moon. He just liked the music, invited me on tour. So I go on tour. While I'm on the tour bus, he always like, yo, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out. So then, like, months go by, and then finally, like, at the end of that year or the middle of that year, that's when I got that call. So we caught, me and Exhibit had established a relationship so that when he did call me, I didn't expect that he was going to say the Dre thing because we would talk on the phone periodically, okay. you feel me? Okay, okay. That's why I was trying to get what the call was like. I was trying to, get sure. the, I was trying to be in the room with you, my bad, man. Um, so look. No, you good. <laughs> so look, um, so you got the call. And you, how soon did you get to L.A.? Yeah, it was like the next day. They sent for you? Was, you went out there that fast? Yeah. Or, or you yep. had to get he out He was there like, can own? you be out here tomorrow at like 8? Like so, he want to have dinner with you. So your so, team was ready to get you right out there right away. You, wasn't, you didn't have to think about it. Y'all was ready. Y'all just went out there. Yeah, just went out there to see what he was on. Because we had been having meetings with labels for like a minute. 
So y'all been so prepared was, to move. Say that again. Y'all been prepared to move. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yep, we have we have been we had. And what's so funny about it is at the time that Dre called, I had got to a point in my life where I was like, I don't even want a record deal no more. Like I was like, I'm straight doing the independent thing. Like I was like to me, the money that I was getting for what I was doing was making sense to me. It was like, okay, I, it's cool. This cool with me. I, and I remember saying the phrase, this is why you got to be careful what you say and the power of the tongue is so crazy. Yeah. My sis, another artist from Flint, her name is Lyric the Queen. I remember saying to her on the phone, I was like, yo, I don't even want a deal no more. I said, it's going to take Jay-Z, Dr. Dre, or Puffy to call me for me to sign a deal. Wow. And then no sooner than I said that, I get that Dr. Dre call. That's crazy. That's it crazy. is crazy. Tell the universe what you want and it'll give it to you. It's crazy. It's crazy. So you got to be careful what you wish for. Uh huh. You wish for it. You got it. So look, man, you on that, you know, you on that album that everybody loved from Dre. Was you a part of like a lot of that creative process? Like you was. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I was there the whole time. But I was there to see. Um, I was actually there to see the whole movie come to play from the time them picking out the writers, from them picking out the actors. Like, um, like I was there for the whole thing. I was there when the Compton album, it wasn't even supposed to be an album. At first, it was supposed to just start off as a soundtrack to the movie. Yeah. But he had started making so much new music and there was so much creative energy around him at the time. He like, yo, I might as well make this a, a album. So I got a chance to see a lot of stuff that now people look at as history. I was there when Dre found out he was going to be a billionaire. Like I was there the day when um, they were selling beats or whatever to That's Apple. Crazy. Like I was there, you know, he for a there. lot of stuff that people look at as history now. That's crazy. And you still rocking? You still over there? At Aftermath, nuh-uh. I left Aftermath in 2019. So you, okay, uh, and you back on the independent? Absolutely. One that I am a, I'm an indie artist to my core. I like being in control of my own destiny. I like, I'm a, I'm a eat what you kill type person. So you I gotta, know what I'm saying? I, I gotta ask like, this. So, Since you <laughs> experienced both, and I feel like, obviously, once you, once you rock with Dre, independent can be, is gonna be cool because you already got what you, you know, you're doing what you're doing. But, would you would you sign another deal? I would probably sign a partnership situation, but never again would I ever sign as like an artist being under somebody or like a regular artist deal. Never again. I, I do feel like, and this is not a knock to Aftermath or Interscope. I, it's a knock to just the way the music industry is set up just in general. I think all artist deals are slave deals. I don't think there is a such thing as a good artist deal. And that's not, like I say, that's not just specific to Aftermath. That's every that. major in label. General. And um, I remember Kanye West talking one time about having the people that own these labels like sit and have a public forum on TV where they talk about the deals and you really get to expose what these artists are signing. It's like, so no, I would never sign a regular artist deal ever again in my life. But a partnership deal, like you know what I'm saying, or something like that, like that might work. But I, I think that all record company artist deals are slave deals. And no, I wouldn't. Okay, okay. And that and I just that means a lot because you, you know, I never really heard about Aftermath doing bad business. So it's not like you're saying the business was bad. You're just saying the way the deals are structured, it just ain't for you. Period. Just in the whole music business. See, it's not like Interscope and Aftermath is doing something. Everybody's like doing they're, they just doing what record companies do. You know what I'm saying? The way that it's structured. I think, like I said, like those labels themselves aren't bad. I think that just the structure of the music industry itself is bad. Yeah, it sounds okay. like to me you, you found out how the machine works and you figured out I can make this work for myself. So instead of being part Bingo. of Bingo, I can just do this on my own. Bingo. When you get behind the curtain and you see, oh, this person do this and this person do that. And if you're an intelligent person, you're like, well, wait, I could do that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or you start looking like, wait a minute, I, I had that idea or I had an idea better than that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Then you start thinking to yourself, well, wait, 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 what, what am I doing? Like, what am I actually doing this for? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. absolutely. You like I could get I got family members or I got people in my team that I could be doing these same things. That could us. be doing like, the same yeah. thing, possibly even doing it better. Yeah, see, see. So um, now, the music. Will you feel like um, the the music has anything changed with the music? It's the same. I think for me, you me personally, has my music changed? Yeah. 
after um, like going from from Dr. Dre? Because are, are you still do you still got access to Dr. Dre? Like you still get beats from him? Well, I still have his phone number. If that's what you and mean, will he like, pick up, like if you call Dre, you think he'll pick up the phone? Well, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that. That's so funny. I get it. I get it because like the perception. Yeah, but yeah. yes, I, I do. I believe that. Like we spoke, um, we spoke after I left aftermath. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think the thing that'd be funny to people to, to me is like humans are just humans at the end of the day. People are just people. Whether you got five dollars in your pocket or a billion dollars in your pocket, you still a person. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So um, so yeah, we spoke actually when um he had the situation with the brain aneurysm. Oh, okay. Like we spoke like a week before that, and then we spoke while he was in the hospital. Okay, so, so y'all still you still even though, chop it up with him. Well, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I think that people think that just because you don't do business with people, you have to end up hating them, or that it's some type of beef, or it's whatever. It's like, nah. Okay, this business thing didn't work out, but as a human, I rock with you. You know what I'm saying? You ain't slap my mama. I ain't call your mama no name. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. well, well, we we just we go through life and we learn lessons. So it was like after I left after Matt, me and him spoke a couple times. Yeah, uh, John, I think that's dope that you and uh, Dre still on speaking terms because, you know, the perception of the music industry and how most artists are, as soon as they stop messing with somebody, it's fuck them. And they, you know, they get to talking bad about them and all that. Like, it seemed like you guys had, like, a cool relationship. You learned some shit and y'all still on speaking terms to the point where, you know, it ain't no beef. I just wanted to know that because, like I said, you know how it usually is. People would be like, man, fuck this nigga. As soon as you're not around them no more, so... Well, yeah, for me, bro, I look at it like just as black men, bro, I would never partake in anything of down talking another black man, period. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then also, I think that that's an that's a important myth to dispel, that after people don't do business with each other no more, that they beefing with each other. It's like I learned the lessons that I was supposed to learn while I was there. And also, it's like, uh, you know, when you ask me, like, if you call Dr. Dre right now, it's like, it's funny, it's like... When I was on Aftermath, I had reasons to speak to him every day. It's like, now we don't do business with each other, so of course I don't speak to dude every day. But when we left each other's presence, or the last time we spoke, it was all love. And I think that that's how it should be in business. I think that that's how it should be, just period, when it comes to like the media and us as Black people, how we portray each other. Exactly. I think that it's too much of us fuck this nigga, fuck that nigga, whatever the case may be. It's like, no, I had a business arrangement Okay, uh, it happened. It ran this course. You know what I'm saying? And um, that just is that's part of life. Like I always tell people, bro, not to get stuck on this. But like for me, aftermath was like any other thing, like high school or elementary school. You go through certain points of your life to learn the lessons you need to learn, and then you elevate and graduate to the next portion of your life. So everything that I learned at aftermath university, man, I apply it to my um my life now as an independent artist, and I was blessed to be able to uh, sit under the learning tree with homeboy and everybody else that was over there. And now to me, I'm looking to make a mark on this game, like a Dre, like a Jay-Z, like a Puff Daddy. It's like, it was dope. Like you got to think before Puff became Puff, he studied under Andre Pharrell. I mean, Andre Harrell. You know what I'm saying? Ooh. Before 50 became 50, he was around, uh, you know what I'm saying? Chris Lighty, you know what I'm saying? And learning the game. So I look at my life like that. My time at Aftermath as an artist was what that was like for a Puff or a 50. I was yeah. supposed to be under one of the greats so that I could become one of the greats. And the only way you could do that is mm -hmm. to learn from them. So I got nothing but love for Dre and Aftermath. And I enjoyed my time there. Had some good times, some bad times, but it made me the man I'm supposed to be. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. So I got a question. How are you going to apply the knowledge that you got from Dre to your own uh, your own record label? You know, what's your record label called? Do you have any artists under you? Or are you just pushing your own music right now? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, the name of the company is All Varsity Music Group. All Varsity Music Group um, is the name of the company. And... I already like it's so funny from uh you know I like I said I've worked with Dre but I also want to give credit to all the other great people that I've worked with like a DJ Paul from Three Six Mafia Kelly Price like just legendary people 
you can't help but to be around people like that and to immediately start incorporating the things that they do into what you do. Even shout out to Marsha Ambrosia, like the way that I record now, my recording process definitely changed as a result of being around all of those people. Even my outlook on the business and just what's important, the important parts of the business, you know what I'm saying? All of those things definitely changed and made me grow and I apply it every day. Like I say, I do business now. Like I used to be able to sit there and I watched Dre in meetings with the staff at Apple. And I watched how he conducted himself. You know what I'm saying? I was able to have dinners, you know. Oh, say that. I'm sorry. I said I that, that's different. Seeing Dre talk to Apple, that's different. You feel me? Like, so exactly, man. And I, I didn't take, I was always a sponge. I sat there with Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, and Jay-Z while they had a business conversation. Like, you know what I'm saying? I sat there with Jimmy and Mary J. Blige and Dre. So it was like all these times that I was in these situations, I just soaked up all the game like a sponge. And so I'd be a fool not to take these things that I was uh, blessed enough to be around and apply it to myself. But people definitely going to see. You'll be able to hear it in the music and also just with the moves that I make going forward. You got? Do you have any artists on the label? Right now, it's just me. I've learned, man, taking on artists. Uh huh. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Bruh. <laughs> Let's talk it, about it, man. Man, it's a difficult thing because uh, sometimes to learn things, people got to put their hand on the stove and get burnt, right? Yeah. And when you take on younger artists, it's almost like you're trying to stop them from burning their hand on the stove. Only they don't believe the stove is hot yet until they touch it. So you're met with, it's like a lot of times people have to go through things to learn the lesson. And so with young artists, they think they know and they don't. And so that becomes difficult because then they start feeling like, oh, you hold me back or you ain't letting me do this or you ain't letting me do that or it should be like this. And it's like you got to sometimes just let artists experience things on their own so they can learn the lessons and figure it out. So right now, Taking on new artists is not on my plate because I am not for the headache right now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. So, I'm, I'm glad to hear like somebody with your level of experience in the game and what you've been around, that knowledge, say that because me and three of my, me and two of my homeboys left the label because we was like, y'all holding us back. Really, they was doing shit for us and we just was feeling like we was bigger than the program. But I'm just, when you said it, it would just hit full circle. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. That's Other people, oh, that, good, there's gonna be a man. young artist that yeah, see this really, and be like, "Damn, I need to hear that." You really need. You need to have your ears open to an, uh, someone in your. Position, I appreciate you know, that, man. Well, like God say, ain't nothing new under the sun. So it's like you know, it's just that's the circle of life, and I finally realized it because for a long time. I was trying to do the thing where I had a crew and I built up young artists and giving them the game and all of that, and then I realized like no matter what combination of artists, youthful thinking is always gonna be youthful thinking. You know what I'm saying? The youth is always going to think they know better. They always going to feel like the generation above them is trying to suppress them. Yeah, because you so feel it's like, like now, hey, y'all might have messed up or something. Man, y'all don't know what the hell yeah, y'all talking you know Yeah, how? that's what happened to you, but that ain't going to happen to me. Exactly. That's what That's what they all think. So now I'm not opposed to giving game to young artists, but as far as like signing them and stuff like that, I don't want to be in control of nobody's destiny to that degree right now. It's like I'm focused on myself and my label, but if any young artists ever want game or just I feel like game is to be shared. So for me, if I got it to give, I'm going to give it to you. But as far as locking an artist down in a contract and all that type of stuff and being financially obligated, nah, I ain't at that place right now. Okay, okay, okay. I just wanted to hear it from you because, you know, I'm pretty sure, like, you being from Flint, too, like, that you might have some expectations. I know... There's probably some people that were expecting you to come back home and just sign the hella niggas, and it's like, no, nah, that's not what we're doing right now. But you know what's crazy? When I first came back from Aftermath, I did try to do that, and uh, that's what convinced me that, nah, this ain't, nah. You know what I'm saying? Like, this ain't, this ain't what it is. And it's nothing against those artists. It's just like I said, sometimes you have to allow people to go through the journey, and they'll come back and thank you later. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I remember when you tried to tell me da 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 or I remember when you tried to say this. Sometimes you just got to let people... Here, I'll give you this analogy, and then y'all can ask. I don't want to talk too much, but I'll give you this analogy. My dad once told me, he said, do you know what happens to a caterpillar if you try to open the cocoon too early? It dies. The only way the caterpillar can become a butterfly is its wings become strong enough to open the ca uh, cocoon on its own. So with humans, you got to allow them to go through the journey to open up their cocoon by themselves. 
And then they'll come to you as a butterfly, like, yo, now give me that game you was trying to give me again when I was a caterpillar. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's how life works. You can't force them out the cocoon before they ready. That's facts. Um, Before we get out of here. Um, For sure. Have you ever acted before? Nah, I haven't. Would I haven't. You, I think act? I might have did some cameos and some little stuff, but nothing too serious. Would you act, though, bro? I'm shooting a movie I'll- called Hitting Licks. And I think I got a role for you, man. Definitely. Well, come on, man. Let's get it popping. Come we on. We're gonna talk nah, about it outside of here because I can't really. Yeah, say for sure. Yeah. But yeah, we're gonna talk about it outside this interview. I'm gonna hit your. Well, yeah, and I, and no bullshit. If I say it, I mean it. Then let's okay. talk about it. Okay. Um, any new projects or anything you want the people to know about? They already know they can follow you at John Connor Music. Is that what it is on everything? Absolutely on everything. And be um, my album is getting mixed right now. It's called Three. It's coming out probably at the end of November. Um, then after that, me and my man, the legendary DJ KLC, who produced all the big songs for No Limit, make them say, um, fuck them other niggas, uh, move, bitch, get out the way for Ludacris. Me and him got a whole project that's crazy. Uh, I got another project called Food for the Soul. Me and my uh, homeboy DJ Silk got a project. So it's just, I think every three months, I'm going to be dropping new music. You working, man. You yes, guys, sir. Uh, make sure you guys follow John Cotter. Or everything. Follow I Am Heyday or everything. Follow J Walk Entertainment. Follow Man Listen. Uh, follow the Little Ass Podcast. That show comes on every week and it's dope. You guys should watch it. It's a dope ass show. Monday and Wednesday. What time it come on? Eight o'clock Pacific Standard Time. So that means eleven o'clock Eastern Time. Um, we about to get up out of here. Shout out to the crew, everybody that makes the show happen. Shout out to you though, John, for taking time out your day. You know, yeah. Uh, nah, I appreciate y'all. Thank y'all for having me. And when the album drop, we got to do this again, man. Oh, when the album drop, we go review that thing live. With you, with you, we go probably have you out here and just do it. Hey, like come that. on now, let's get it. Yeah, the album might. When is the album dropping? I'm it's thinking fine. late November. Late okay. November. I'm gonna make sure I plan your scene around that time so we can get you out here. Come on now, let's get it popping. Yeah, All right, bet. Appreciate sure you. Tap you. in with our song battles too. Hey, let's get it. I'm hey, I'm with whatever. Hey, Day is my dog. Like that's my dog for life. That's my brother. So hey, man, any friends of his is friends of mine. Oh, it's family. All right, man. I appreciate you, man, man. Yes, man, sir. Listen, we out. Peace.